So for everyone who's attending, I think Pete Nelson, um, who is presently a professor of medicine and medical oncology and member at the POTCH where he does his research. And at the U, he practices medicine half a day a week. But background, he was educated uh, through residency in internal medicine at the University of Kansas, then a year as a biotech fellow at NCI, followed by a year as a generalist house physician in uh, just outside of Kathmandu in Nepal and also in uh, St. Lucia in the West Indies. Came to Seattle in 1993 doing a fellowship in Medong in hematology, uh, working with Lee Hood as his mentor. And then he joined the faculty uh, of medicine uh, at UW and uh, a couple of years later moved his laboratory to the Fred Hodge Cancer Center. So he's now a professor of medicine in medical oncology and a full member of human biology and clinical research at the Fred Hodge Cancer Research Center. More important for this, he's leader of the uh, consortium program in prostate cancer research and he's PI of our Pacific Northwest and CI's uh, sponsored and funded prostate cancer spore, as well as serving multiple national and international roles. So he's going to elaborate on um, spatial genomics, this new area era that he is, uh, he is really uh, leading with respect to prostate cancer. And for those attend, I think Pete really represents uh, the iconic clinician side. So Pete, take her away. Hey, thanks so much, Larry, for the introduction. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you. All right, all right. Can you also see the pointer as I move it? Uh, yes. Okay, great. Um, so it's really a pleasure to uh, speak about uh, this work um, that is really highly collaborative with many members in the Department of Pathology as well as Laboratory Medicine. This particular work also represents a, uh, a really nice collaboration with Nanostring, which has, uh, as a company, developed some approaches for digital spatial profiling that I will get into. Um, these are my conflicts of interest uh, with this nanostring collaboration uh, that I alluded to. Um, so this is how I'll frame the discussion of what we'll talk about. I think it's important to start by putting uh, this in perspective. That is the really state of the field around uh, metastatic or advanced prostate cancer. Um, which then frames some of the major research and clinical questions. And then I'll get into the uh, design of the project uh, that we uh, developed around this digital spatial profiling and then get into the results uh, that primarily were designed to understand intrametastatic heterogeneity. And I'll define that a little bit later. Uh, but we also looked at intermetastatic heterogeneity and um, one of the anticipated uh, results was that we may be able to find some new insights uh, relating to tumor biology that could also have some clinical uh, relevance. So <clears throat> I'm going to spend a little bit of time just framing uh, what I'll later talk about in uh, the role of the digital spatial profiling um, by starting off with just the background in advanced or metastatic prostate cancer. This is what I treat clinically uh, primarily, and there have been some real major changes in how we approach the disease uh, over the last really 10 years and really accelerated just in the last three or four. So advanced prostate cancer still accounts for around 30,000 deaths every year in the U.S. Um, so the vast majority of deaths due to prostate cancer, not surprisingly, are due to metastatic disease. Um, so a major question is how do we reduce mortality? Uh, one, obviously, which I'm not going to talk into, is better prevention, better treatment for early disease such that you no, never develop metastatic disease, but also improving therapy for metastatic disease. And that is identifying and understanding the major drivers, applying specific therapies, the whole concept around precision medicine, precision oncology, anticipating and understanding resistance mechanisms, mechanisms that emerge, co-targeting these resistance mechanisms, and then really the kind of major focal point for this talk is tumor heterogeneity. <clears throat> so I think about uh, advanced prostate cancer from a 
diagnostic point of view first, which is why I think it has relevance to pathology and laboratory medicine. And that is we wanna classify these tumors because we now recognize that prostate cancer isn't simply one entity. There are many, many different subtypes uh, primarily defined at the molecular level, uh, a subset of which dictate a specific therapy. So the whole concept around precision medicine is really based on the premise that there is variability, there is variation between individuals, um, across individuals. Um, and as I'll talk about a little bit later, precision medicine is going to be very challenged if there is substantial intra-individual uh, heterogeneity. So arguably the very first precision medicine treatment uh, in all of oncology focused on the androgen receptor. So this is Charles Huggins' Nobel Laureate address. Uh, he was the individual that uh, determined that prostate cancer was extraordinarily sensitive to testosterone and simply by removing testosterone at that point in time surgically, you could have dramatic responses. So one could argue this was a precision therapy because it was focused on a particular molecular target, the androgen receptor. However, I would also say it's not very precise because every patient was treated the same way. Um, and this was the standard therapy for prostate cancer for more than 50 years. Every man was treated with uh, an approach to suppress testosterone. And so this was the disease trajectory for about 50 years. And that is <clears throat> if somebody developed metastatic prostate cancer, you would give androgen deprivation therapy, you would get a response often very gratifying response lasting for two to three years, and then a, a very consistent inexorable increase in uh, tumor growth, ultimately resistance uh, leading to death. So this was castration resistant metastatic prostate cancer. So uh, the real changes have come about by uh, recognizing that the major driver for this castration resistant prostate cancer is still focused on the androgen receptor. So additional drugs have been developed um, that continue to target or repress androgen receptor signaling. Uh, and then we also do use chemotherapy. Each of these has been shown to prolong survival, but not cure uh, patients. Many of these are now being used earlier in the disease course and having even better responses uh, with prolongation of, of life and survival, but still no complete cures consistently. And we're now also starting to see resistance mechanisms and pathways that no longer rely on the androgen receptor. <clears throat> so this paper um, it was published based on Stand Up to Cancer, a large Stand Up to Cancer project that we were uh, contributors to. And it was really the first attempt to, uh, in a large scale, define the underlying genomic alterations that occur in advanced prostate cancer. And so um, in this heat map, so to speak, each patient, this is the first 150 patients on the study are in uh, columns and then the particular molecular aberration is in a row. Um, and I think from just taking the 50,000 foot view, you can see dramatic heterogeneity here across patients, um, where some patients may have a mutation in BRCA2 down here about halfway, whereas many others don't. So the argument here is that there are distinct drivers in subsets of prostate cancer um, and the question was, could you specifically target those individual drivers such that some patients would have more exceptional responses, whereas others wouldn't respond? We now know that to be true for BRCA2, for BRCA1 in prostate cancer. We know that to be true for mismatch repair uh, as well. And so um, <clears throat> there's also the genomic underpinnings of this, the germline uh, alteration. So this is really nice work from Colin Pritchard. Uh, demonstrating that men with advanced prostate cancer have inherited mutations in a, a, a composite set of genes, mostly involving DNA repair, such as BRCA2 and ATM and uh, uh, BRCA1. Um, so there's this genomic feature, subtypes that are not only heritable, but also uh, primarily uh, at the somatic level. So this is the way I think about it. At this point, we're talking about dividing advanced prostate cancer into distinct molecular subtypes. These are a number of them uh, on the left. Um, uh, a number of these are then 
targetable with specific therapies, PARP inhibitors, platinum, uh, immune checkpoint blockade, whereas others, we still don't yet have particular therapeutics directed toward them, although these are emerging quickly as well, such as um, PI3 kinase AKT pathway inhibitors and P10 loss tumors. So that's been uh, pretty much a foundation um, of recent work, uh, but there's another layer on top of this, and that is in addition to genotypes, there are distinct phenotypes. So I talked primarily about the androgen receptor active or driven tumors that have been the common phenotype. Um, these express androgen regulated proteins such as PSA, which you can readily, readily measure in the serum, but they're now recognized to be a number of other phenotypes that we believe are occurring at increased uh, frequency. So this is, uh, these are data from the University of Washington Rapid Autopsy Program, really that Larry has spearheaded along with Colm Morrissey and many other members of the department uh, have participated very actively in this program. It really has served as a, as a discovery tool as well as developing resources to actually do causal uh, type studies. So we went back and looked in the rapid autopsy program at these phenotypes, and I'm only showing you three phenotypes here, the typical AR active uh, prostate cancer, expressing PSA and a whole suite of AR regulated genes. Um, then there's a neuroendocrine or small cell variant and what, uh, a new one that we identified that we call double negative, and I'll get into that a little bit later. So you can see prior to the ad widespread use of these second and third generation androgen receptor pathway antagonists, um, these uh, a AR inactive variants were fairly rare. But now with the widespread use of these very potent AR pathway antagonists, the frequency of these uh, tumors that do not have active androgen receptor program activity has increased quite substantially. And I think as we continue to improve upon approaches to target the androgen receptor, the hypothesis would be that we'll start to see these escape variants occurring even more frequently. <clears throat> so this is now what we see. Um, so if you take typical androgen receptor active metastatic prostate cancer, we apply treatment pressure in terms of androgen deprivation therapy. Then we add more treatment pressure after those tumors resist simply suppressing testosterone. Uh, these are the second and third generation AR pathway antagonists, so we're applying more pressure. We still see escape through reactivation of the androgen receptor program, but as I mentioned, we're now starting to see these other variants emerging that are due to cell plasticity and transdifferentiation. This talk is really not about that process per se. We do see overt small cell tumors but we more commonly now see uh, tumors that express neuroendocrine uh, genes without an overt small cell uh, recognizable um, phenotype or histology. There's also an amphicrine type, I'll talk about it in a moment. There are stem cell variants, mesenchymal variants, basal double negative, uh, and others. So um, we're uh, again seeing these occurring more frequently without a very distinctive underlying genomic uh, feature. So the idea of these are primarily epigenetic uh, alterations, although there may be permissive uh, alterations such as RB1 and P53 loss that allow these new characteristics to occur. This work by Colin Morrissey, Larry, and, and many others in our group, and <clears throat> it demonstrates quite readily that using gene expression it is possible to uh, determine phenotypes um, that are not, again, simply recognized by an underlying genotype. So this is again from the rapid autopsy program. I'm showing you in this uh, schematic five different subtypes. These will be relevant later because this was one of the areas that we focused on with the spatial profiling. But for example, there's AR active neuroendocrine negative and these top uh, two panels are neuro, neuronal or neuroendocrine genes. Uh, and then the AR program, these are genes regulated by the androgen receptor. So this is all transcription-based 
uh, whole, whole RNA seq from uh, a whole uh, suite of these metastatic uh, tumors. So again, here, each column is a different tumor from a metastasis. Uh, each row is the gene, and then we've divided them up into particular programs. So then there's this amphocrine type. So these tumors still have an AR program that's active, uh, but they also have a neuroendocrine uh, program that's active. And then the others are pretty much self-explanatory, AR low, neuroendocrine negative, double negative tumors, uh, et cetera. So here's an example of the amphocrine tumor. Um, these tumors, uh, the question was or is, do you have a metastasis that is a distinct mixture of cells, a subset of those cells may be AR active neuroendocrine negative, other cells may be uh, AR negative neuroendocrine active. What this basically shows is that these cells are actually the same cell has both programs on. Uh, so the same cells are co-expressing AR regulated genes and genes associated with neuroendocrine activity. So this is what Larry has called an amphocrine uh, type tumor. And here's an example of a squamous tumor. This is a double negative tumor, doesn't have any neuroendocrine activity, doesn't have any AR uh, program activity, but it's now uh, exhibiting squamous histology as well as a number of genes uh, expression associated with uh, squamous uh, uh, differentiation. So just the point here is that we're now seeing these different phenotypes emerging. So from a pathological standpoint, a diagnostic standpoint, and then a practical clinical treatment standpoint, the question is uh, partly a technical one, a practical question. If you're sampling a given tumor, a given metastasis, um, or the primary tumor, is that primary tumor uh, sufficient if you did a characterization of it, whether it's a genomic characterization or a phenotypic characterization, is that original diagnosis sufficient to uh, determine what the metastasis would look like? Um, does the primary reflect the metastasis? And if you're just sampling a single metastatic site, does that reflect the rest of the uh, metastases in that patient such that you could feel confident applying a given therapy. And the argument here relating to precision medicine is that substantial tumor heterogeneity would really curtail the effectiveness of precision medicine since the target you're going after wouldn't be represented uh, universally. This study gave us uh, pause. This was a, a very nice study from another rapid autopsy program. Um, where deep whole genome sequencing was performed on uh, a number of metastatic tumors from about 10 different patients. This is simply showing one patient and multiple tumors, metastatic tumors from that patient, uh, looking at mutations and copy number changes uh, somatically in these tumors. And the point of the paper was that you clearly see these branches emerging, such there may be a trunk of common alterations, but then uh, there are all these uh, branches and twigs uh, out here with very distinct uh, mutations that weren't present in the trunk. This work is very similar to Charles Swanton's uh, work looking at renal cell cancer showing these um, uh, tumor hierarchies. Uh, so <clears throat> this would really uh, curtail again the effectiveness of precision medicine if you're losing particular targets out here in branches or you're gaining uh, uh, new mechanisms of uh, tumor drivers out here. So this is an example of just a blow up of one of these um, uh, tumor, uh, one of these patients where you have uh, distinctive uh, genomic alterations out here uh, as that tumor apparently uh, evolved. Our question was, are these important? Are these alterations in the branch and the leaves really relevant uh, in terms of treatment. So um, this was, an, uh, again, working through our rapid autopsy at the University of Washington program. We looked at 63 men and profiled 176 tumors. And we found generally substantial homogeneity if we looked across metastases from the same patient at the genetic or genomic level. So here's one example of um, four or five different tumors from this patient looking phenotypically at androgen receptor activity, neuroendocrine activity, ERG, a known oncogene and prostate cancer expression, 
the number of uh, non-synonymous variants, PP3 mutation, et cetera, et cetera. And then simply overlaying the overall copy number plots, you can see that these tumors look almost uh, identical in terms of their uh, genomic uh, composition. So if we go back to this idea of trunk bench, twig and leaf, when we went out here to look at these private mutations, mutations occurring only in individual tumors from these men, um, there were essentially no driver uh, alterations uh, out here. <clears throat> uh, the drivers were all in the shared um, uh, trunk for these metastases. Now, this may be somewhat unique to prostate in the sense that our major at this point treatment pressure focused on androgen receptor. Um, we didn't at this point in time have other effective therapies such that they would apply pressure and you would maybe develop resistance mechanisms through uh, other um, uh, unique uh, drivers. So that is the one caveat here. Here's a three-dimensional plot looking at uh, the tumors, for example, from one patient compared to all of the other tumors from uh, the autopsy uh, program, the other 60 some odd men. And we're simply looking to see copy number, gene expression and non-synonymous mutations. You can see that all the tumors from this particular patient all very closely clustered together, such that if you were to biopsy any one of these tumors, you would be very likely to represent, it would represent the major genomic uh, and phenotypic uh, features of all of the other tumors in that patient. Um, <clears throat> now this is the general rule that we concluded, but there are clearly exceptions to this rule. I don't wanna um, minimize that. Uh, Michael Hafner has been working on some really interesting studies uh, along with Martin Rudier and Larry to look at different phenotypes here, but by and large, this is what we uh, concluded from this study. Here's another example of just overlaying all the copy number plots for multiple metastases. I think we had 11 for this particular uh, individual. And you can see they're very, very, very similar. There are a few uh, unique features to each one, but by and large, superimposable. And all of, if we just use a clustering system based on copy number alterations, and use an unsupervised uh, cluster, all the patients clustered with each other, um, indicating some degree of homogeneity here. So that's really the background. So the major research and clinical questions that this really led to, most of our work was really looking at inter-tumor relationships. Um, those are between and within a patient. Uh, but now we have new techniques and technologies that do allow for spatial profiling within a tumor to understand is there intratumor variation, to what extent is it occurring, and is that relevant for how we would interpret therapy or important for understanding treatment resistance. Um, so these are what we set out to do here, and that is what's the extent of inter and intratumoral heterogeneity in metastatic disease are there components of heterogeneity that could influence treatment responses? And then we, can we gain any new insights into tumor biology that may be useful for, uh, for therapy? So <clears throat> now we'll get into the, the study design that we undertook for this digital spatial profiling um, uh, study that, um, that I'll focus on here. So <clears throat> this was really designed to try to start to uh, get a handle on the intra tumor heterogeneity, but we needed to design this in such a way that we could uh, verify that the approach that we're using uh, would also recapitulate what we had already seen from these more bulk tumor analyses. So this, uh, sorry, goes back to the rapid autopsy program. So we started with 27 patients. We took two metastases from each patient. So we now have a total of 56 metastases. Um, we took three cores. Colin Morrissey did the vast majority of this work, three cores from each tumor. And so that represents as a starting point, the spatial aspect of this project. So three distinct cores from that metastasis gives us some space. Those cores were used to construct tissue microarrays just to facilitate the high throughput nature of the project. So we have a total of 168 um, tumor cores samples. And as a starting point, we took a single region of interest 
from each of these cores. And this is a 500 micron uh, region of interest enriched for tumor. So we can talk at the very end about tumor microenvironment and looking at the spatial region near a tumor or far from a tumor. These are all metastases. So the focus initially was tumor rich regions of this. And this encompassed 16 tissue types, they included bone, um, which we weren't sure that this process would work in, in, in bone. These are all formal and fixed tissue. So all the work that we had done before used uh, frozen samples uh, to preserve the RNA so that we could do whole uh, RNA-seq uh, on them. But in this case, these were all formal and fixed tissues dating back in some cases, eight to nine years. Um, and so that was really the, also a test to see how effective this approach worked. And so here's an example. I'm gonna come back to this tumor a little bit later. Here's a tumor, just the H&E section. And here's an example of a region of interest that we uh, took. Um, in this particular case, we came back to it later and sampled more regions. So you can get an idea of what this looked like. But the point being it's, the whole tumor is very cellular. Um, and if we take a region of interest, 500 microns or so, that would be a starting point. So <clears throat> the method that we used really was developed by Nanostring, uh, Geomics uh, Digital Spatial Profiling. I'm just gonna briefly walk through the method here in case uh, you're not familiar with it. The, ad the advantage of the system is quantitative uh, in the sense that you're enumerating uh, captured barcodes, and it can measure protein based on antibody binding or RNA. It uses fixed uh, samples. You basically cut a section, um, seven to 10 microns. Uh, the RNA probes, um, now I think they're up to essentially a whole transcriptome. In this early study, we used um, RNA probes uh, reflecting about 2,100 genes. So there were three to 10 oligonucleotides for each transcript, just kind of tiling across the transcript in many cases. Each of the um, <clears throat> probes has a unique barcode onto it. So if you capture that probe back, you can um, quantitate uh, that barcode and determine how many copies of the RNA there were. So the way the system works, you simply overlay the solution with um, your uh, probes with barcodes onto the slide. The probes will bind to the RNA uh, and then you choose a region of interest under the microscope. Uh, that region of interest can be as small as 20 microns or it could be the entire uh, section. In our case, we use 500 microns. And then uh, there's a UV light that you focus on whatever particular region of interest you would like that cleaves the barcode. So the photocleaved uh, oligo is released. That's aspirated uh, up and deposited in the tube. And this can be quantitated or read out either with their encounter system or by next gen sequencing. Uh, so the same thing for proteins, you, you tag the uh, antibody with a barcode, uh, you overlay in the exact same way, photocleave the barcode. Um, and in this study, I'll get to at the very end, we looked at about 60 antibodies multiplexed uh, as well. But most of the data I'm going to show is the transcript-based quantitation of gene expression. So the study design were looking first inter-individual variation, second intra-individual variation, and then third intra-tumor uh, variation. And most of the variation that I'm talking about is not at the genomic level, it's at the phenotype level. <clears throat> and that is the AR positive, neuroendocrine negative, neuroendocrine positive, AR negative, et cetera. We have six different phenotypes of interest as a, as a starting uh, point. So the first aspect is intermetastatic heterogeneity. So what I'm showing you here just at the top, this is gonna be a recurrent type of figure. So each of the tumors is shown in a, in a column uh, and then each row has some 
particular feature in the top, it's the site of the metastasis. Then we have androgen receptor program activity. So we're compiling 10 different genes to generate a signature. Then neuroendocrine signature, the cell cycle scores. This is like a rich man or a poor man's KI-67, whichever way you want to look at it. In this case, we're then showing the class, the phenotype based on the bulk RNA-seq that we had already done for these tumors. And then the class produced by the digital spatial uh, profiling. So in this case, all the tumors from all the patients are ordered by the AR activity, not by patient. So you can see across here, there is substantial heterogeneity in our cohort, in our group, from tumors that are very AR high, AR program high, to those tumors that are very AR program low. These are the genes that went into the AR program and the neuroendocrine program, just so you can see how they varied, um, all measured by digital spatial profiling. And then on the right, we have a multidimensional plot just um, showing how these tumors group, which really mirrored what we had already seen by RNA-seq. So the point of this is that we're able to recapitulate using formal and fixed samples based on digital spatial profiling what we had already seen classified by the bulk RNA-seq. So we can at least recapitulate uh, that. And on the bottom two are the RNA-seq based and the digital spatial profiling based um, correlations of the androgen receptor signature and the cell, cell cycle progression score or the KI-67 sort of output. So very high concordance really. Um, also recognizing uh, although the tumor was the same, the region of the tumor sampled was separate. For the RNA-seq that we had done a couple of years ago, that was a different piece of that metastasis that had been sectioned and removed. And the DSP is using a, the same tumor, but a different piece of that tumor. So <clears throat> the extent of inter-individual heterogeneity, this seems pretty straightforward. Um, it's what I had already shown you from our previous work. If you look at the very bottom, now we have each patient grouped. So the two tumors from each patient and what their classification was. If you look on the lower right, these are the six classes, the phenotype classes. So you can see that the majority of tumors from the same, the two tumors from the same patient generally have the same class. So in the far left, these are two AR positive, neuroendocrine negative. If we look here, 16071, both of the tumors from that patient classify as AR negative neuroendocrine positive. Um, <clears throat> importantly, we can look at bone. So this was, again, something that we weren't sure would work. These are decalcified uh, bone samples uh, from the rapid autopsy program. Overall, the signal count was clearly lower uh, compared to soft tissue. Um, but here's the concordance of the, of a tumor sample that's bone versus non-bone in that patient. And we can see that there is high uh, concordance of gene expression overall. The bone sample um, informatively did have transcripts that were derived from bone cells. Um, so there's a couple of those that are circled there in orange. So here's uh, a blow up of the three cases that had bone. So the site, the second uh, row down, this, these are the site of metastases and the red are bone. So each of these three patients had a bone site. I think you can see that all the tumors uh, classified the same way. They, in this situation, all of the tumors from these patients were AR positive, neuroendocrine negative. Um, and you can see that the gene expression is uh, generally quite similar, whether we're looking at the bone metastases or a soft tissue site uh, from these patients. Okay, so the next question was, the, what's the extent of intra-individual heterogeneity? I already showed, not surprisingly, there is differences across patients. So again, now we're coming back to looking at the concordance or discordance of the tumors within each patient. So I mentioned the majority of them were concordant, but there are clear examples here of discordant. So if we look at the second patient, there's one tumor that's AR positive, neuroendocrine negative. 
and another tumor from that patient that's amphicrine, AR positive or endocrine uh, positive. <clears throat> so here's a blow up of, I think we had one, two, three, four, five, seven cases where there were discordant uh, uh, phenotypes determined uh, from the two metastases from each of those patients. So the, the general rule is similarity or concordance, but there are clear situations where there is discordance in phenotype within a patient. <clears throat> and here's an example of what would drive that. So in this particular uh, uh, patient, the two metastases, you can see that the AR activity is almost spot on identical across these two metastases, but the neuroendocrine uh, output or expression diverges. So that's why these were classified in two different ways. So overall, if we use the bulk RNA-seq and then we combine all the DSP, the digital spatial profiling data and, and kind of make it pseudo bulk, so not discriminating each region of interest, there's, there was an overall 82% intra-individual concordance uh, across these uh, tumors. <clears throat> okay, so the next question was, what's the intra-metastatic uh, heterogeneity here? So in this case now, <clears throat> we've broken up every tumor based on its regions of interest. So I mentioned that each tumor had three ROIs based on the punch uh, that was used to construct the TMA. So for each tumor, we have three distinctive regions of interest that were profiled. This, this gets fairly busy, um, and I apologize for that, but it, it's a lot of data. Um, with each of these three ROIs, there's the, we group them together just for their um, uh, comparison against RNA-seq. RNA-seq is sort of a pseudo reading. It's the DSP class that's important. So each of these columns is uh, a digital spatial profile readout for that region of interest. We also have on this slide, DSP protein, I'm going to come back to that later, as well as immunohistochemistry uh, for androgen receptor, PSA, and synaptophysin. <clears throat> so I'll come back later and just talk about the concordance around protein. Um, but here, if you look down, I'm showing you the three regions of interest for this particular case, um, three ROIs per tumor. So now we can look within a tumor and see how similar or different these uh, phenotypes actually are. So, and here I just showed, just on this schema, what's immunohistochemistry, what's digital spatial profiling protein quantitation, and then digital spatial profiling transcript uh, quantitation. So if we now look to see what's the concordance of using each of the individual ROIs, we start to see more variation. Um, and in this case, 64% of the ROIs from uh, the same tumor would be concordant versus discordant. And again, we've got six different classes that we're talking about. So we're starting to see more heterogeneity once we start digging into the uh, individual tumor ROIs. Now this one was interesting because in this case, we saw a discordance between the RNA-seq classification, the bulk tumor, and the classification from the digital spatial profiling. So this called into question that <clears throat> was possible our bulk analysis, which called this particular tumor an amphicrine tumor, an AR-positive neuroendocrine tumor, that's the red, whereas digital spatial profiling of the regions of interest that were chosen showed that it was only AR positive. There was no neuroendocrine activity here. And so the question was, was the DSP region chosen one or the other? Did the bulk tumor, did the bulk RNA have two distinct components to it that the DSP happened to not sample one of those components, but it was represented in the bulk RNA seq? So this is that tumor I showed you before, and this is a blow up again of the um, DSP classification 
the digital spatial profiling classification versus the RNA-seq classification. So it turned out for the DSP in this tumor, we chose ROIs down here in the bottom left corner of the tumor. Um, but it turns out this tumor is fully cellular, you know, throughout this uh, tumor piece, but it's this region on the lower left that is pan-CK positive, and this cytokeratin uh, expression is not present in the remainder of the tumor. So we went ahead and took regions of interest, you can see here uh, shown on the slide, in multiple areas of this tumor and looked at uh, gene expression there, as well as additional areas within this CK positive area. So it turns out the CK positive area has very high levels of AR program activity. But as you start moving away into the more distal parts of this tumor, it loses uh, AR activity, androgen receptor program activity, and gains neuroendocrine activity, as well as components of the MAP kinase and FGF pathway um, in this region. So <clears throat> we're not sure exactly if this represents kind of a collision tumor of a metastasis to a metastasis, whether there's been some sort of trans differentiation process, but it clearly emphasizes an example of profound tumor heterogeneity uh, within one of these metastases. So this is definitely the exception rather than the rule, but it's a pretty striking example. So if we go back and look at the intratumor heterogeneity aspect, <clears throat> if we look overall at the correlation, you can see that the intra-tissue compared to intra-patient compared to inter-patient, there's still more uh, association, more correlation in overall gene expression intra-tissue or intra-tumor compared to inter-patient. Um, what we've done here is uh, shown every tumor uh, here in a column. And now we're looking at the three regions of interest, three ROIs from the spatially distinct part of that tumor uh, and simply plotted it based on its androgen receptor activity or in the bottom graph, the cell cycle progression or kind of KI67 score. So you can see that <clears throat> most of the tumors uh, have within those three ROIs from each tumor, they, they're fairly tight in terms of the overall AR activity. Um, however, there are some tumors, this one in particular, I think I highlighted that one, yeah. So this one in particular, there's one ROI, one region of that tumor that is uh, distinctly different than the two other uh, ROIs. And there's a few other examples. Here's another one here for androgen receptor activity. And then for CCP score, you can start to see more divergence, but still overall, there's more similarity um, in those scores within a patient and within a tumor. But here's an example of a tumor where one region has almost uh, has very low proliferation rate, whereas uh, two other ROIs within that tumor were very high in terms of their CCP score. <clears throat> so I'm going to switch gears a little bit from a practical question, uh, and that is looking at a particular biomarker um, within these metastases. So I talked a lot about androgen receptor being a major driver of prostate cancer. Turns out there's a variant, a splice variant of the androgen receptor called ARB7. ARV7 is able to activate the canonical androgen receptor program without ligand. It doesn't need testosterone. It's constitutively active. And when it's expressed, it may promote resistance to androgen receptor pathway antagonists. And that's basically what this New England Journal paper showed. If you were ARV7 positive, you did not respond well to some of these second and third generation AR pathway antagonists. So here's the structure of the androgen receptor. It's got eight canonical exons, but there's also a number of cryptic exons. So the nice thing about this digital spatial profiling platform is you can design oligonucleotides um, for cryptic exons or to look at unique splice variants, et cetera. And so that's exactly what we did. This cryptic exon three is present in this androgen receptor variant seven, ARV7, which then loses um, the expression of these more distal uh, exons. 
So you can simply compare a ratio of uh, probes for exon four with those for this cryptic uh, exon. So we went back and did this in the spatial profiling for all of the metastases in this particular study. <clears throat> and you can see on, this, on the row second from the bottom, this is the ARV7 called by bulk RNA-seq. And then below that is the ARV7 expression called by digital spatial profiling. So overall, there's very high concordance in both methods. Um, as well as an antibody method. I'll talk about that just briefly a little bit more. That's this uh, line here, ARV7. Um, but you can also start to see that some of these regions of interest are distinctly different. Um, they have either no ARV7 expression or um, higher expression than recognized by the bulk RNA-seq. <clears throat> so here's an example, just a blow up of one of these uh, examples where we do see variation in the individual regions of interest compared to the bulk uh, RNA-seq. So Steve Plymate's group developed an antibody for ARV7. Um, and here's the immunohistochemistry score versus the digital spatial profiling transcript uh, score. So there is a positive correlation, I would, but there are clearly outliers as shown on that uh, at bottom a trajectory with no protein expression, but apparent um, transcript expression. I would, the caveat in part here is that these are not the exact same tumor sections. Again, it's the same tumor, but a different region of the tumor was used for the IHC and for digital spatial profiling. But this is an example of the immunohistochemistry and you can see, I think I have it here, yep. Here's a region where the tumor cells express essentially no ARV7. Um, so you can imagine if this was part of that DSP region of interest, that may be why you would get a discordant uh, level compared to a more bulk uh, based analysis. <clears throat> so I'm gonna skip that. Okay, so what are the new insights possibly that we've gained here in terms of biology? Well, one area that's very unexplored in prostate cancer metastases is the immune system component of these metastases. It is well recognized that prostate cancer does not respond well to immune checkpoint blockade for unclear reasons other than it is a very low mutation burden tumor. Um, so we sought to see if this uh, spatial profiling could start to give us an idea of what the immune cell composition was uh, within these uh, metastases. So we've just broken out a number of uh, markers that denote different uh, immune cell types. And an interesting, uh, two interesting findings. One, there was overall very low uh, presence of immune cells in any of these uh, tumors in any consistent way. So that was the overall take home message. These are really um, immune uh, deserts in a way. But there were a few uh, patients that had consistent uh, presence of certain immune cell types. And it was consistent within both of the metastases from the same patient. So for example, here's a T cell marker in this 14053 patient and all of the ROIs from both of the different, actually this patient had four different tumors sampled and it was present, these cells were present in all four of those metastases. So you can kind of see the patterns uh, going on here. This particular patient, 17081, did have uh, a, a wide spectrum of immune cells infiltrating into these tumors. Again, we're looking intratumorally here, not peritumorally or distant. But the bottom line was um, there was very low immune cell activity within these metastases. We also looked at cytokine programs, um, some of which may be derived from the tumor uh, itself. And we saw the same type of thing in the sense that um, there was homogeneity uh, within a patient uh, that was distinct from the heterogeneity across patients. So if we're looking at the multiple regions of interest and the two tumors, there was much more concordance in terms of their cytokine programs compared to uh, differences across uh, uh, patients. 
So this is where we started to uh, try to tap into the, pro the digital spatial protein profiling. So as I mentioned, we looked at 60, in this case, 57 of the antibodies uh, worked quite well. These are all barcoded. Um, and then we applied them to the same tissue microarrays constructed for the transcript-based uh, profiling. Um, <clears throat> so there was a little bit of benchmarking done first. So these barcodes, as I uh, alluded to earlier on in terms of method, can be read out, can be measured quantitatively either by the nanostring encounter system or by next generation sequencing. And it turns out NGS seems to perform a bit better in terms of discriminating background counts from bona fide counts and also has a wider dynamic range overall, but it's obviously more expensive as well. So there may be some uh, trade-offs there in terms of how the results are read. Here we're simply comparing uh, four different uh, proteins uh, based on the uh, uh, NGS, next generation sequencing quantitation versus uh, the end counter. So you can see that for these uh, fairly abundantly expressed proteins, they were very, very uh, concordant. So both methods would be appropriate uh, here. <clears throat> so now we're overlaying on top of all the transcript data that I showed you before. Now we're looking at the digital spatial protein quantitation and immunohistochemistry. So the immunohistochemistry was read out primarily by Martin Rudier um, uh, using uh, a protein scoring of zero to 200. And by and large, there was substantial concordance. I'm not gonna get into a lot of the details uh, here, but um, the immunohistochemistry and the quantitation from DSP were, were really very, very close um, in terms of uh, protein quantitation for at least androgen receptor and synaptophysin. We didn't have PSA antibodies to be able to look at by digital spatial profiling. So <clears throat> if we then look at these plots based on the phenotype, it makes sense. So we're quantitating protein here now. The phenotype was based on the transcript profile. So those tumors that were AR high, AR active, do at the protein level express high AR. Those that are neuroendocrine, those are in yellow, do not express AR, but those express high synaptophysin. Those are among the most proliferative. CD56 is NCAM, which also is very high in the neuroendocrine type tumors, low in the AR tumor. So um, really nice concordance between the transcript uh, and the protein-based measurements on these uh, TMAs. So then coming back, um, exploring kind of some new biology. Uh, so the first thing we really focused on were immune checkpoint uh, molecules. So as I mentioned, immune checkpoint blockade has not been very successful in prostate cancer with the exception of the hypermutated tumors. And these results really tell us in part why. So if we look at PDL1, both at the transcript and at the protein, PD1 transcript and protein, CTLA4, transcript and protein, basically almost not expressed in any of these metastases. In contrast, this immune checkpoint B7H3 was highly expressed in almost every tumor sample, even more so in the AR active uh, tumors. So B7H3 or CD276 is a very interesting molecule that is starting to get attention, I think, in the immune checkpoint uh, field. Um, it does have known T cell inhibitory function. It's expressed in a wide variety of tumors. And prostate cancer has been shown to associate with poor clinical outcome. And there are monoclonal antibodies developed toward B7H3. They're in various phases of clinical trials, both in the context of enhancing immune response as well as um, and antibody dependent cytotoxicity. So B7H3 was also correlated in our study with TIM3, another immune checkpoint blockade. So these two may be quite interesting to explore further. And we do have some studies now investigating this as a potential mechanism for explaining why prostate cancer is so recalcitrant to immune therapy blockade. So that really concludes things. Um, what I tried to get across is that Metastatic prostate cancer comprises many subtypes, both at the genotype level, 
as well as the phenotype level that have therapeutic implications. The profiling-based uh, approach using the digital spatial uh, transcript and protein quantitation, we found high correlation with RNA-seq methods, clearly able to define the prostate cancer phenotypes. We can see intratumoral heterogeneity using the methods. Using FFPE is a major advantage, I would say, uh, for um, exploiting the technology. And we also found that the protein quantitation correlated very well with traditional IHC with the advantage you can multiplex. So in this case, we looked at 57 proteins uh, simultaneously. Uh, the key is being able to put a barcode on the antibody of interest. We also saw that you can see subtypes within and across metastatic tumors from the same individual, although this was the exception rather than the rule. Um, it was quite interesting to see very few immune cells in these metastases, very distinct from a number of other tumor types such as melanoma. Um, very limited PD-1 and pd one expression, which may explain lack of treatment efficacy. And then this B7H3 seems to be a reasonable target uh, worth uh, further study. <clears throat> so where are we doing next? Uh, an important question is whether the phenotypic heterogeneity, where we do see it, associates with treatment outcomes. We know that genotypic heterogeneity can have a very poor outcome in prostate cancer, but we don't know yet whether phenotypic heterogeneity will as well. Um, it may be useful to think about co-targeting strategies, specifically where we see amphocrine type tumors may need to target both the AR and the neuroendocrine component. Um, and then I mentioned developing clinical trials targeting B7H3. And then where we're going next now is to start using the DSP approach to look at immune cells and the tumor microenvironment in these or around these metastases in the peritumoral region, as well as more distantly to see if there are uh, features that may associate with phenotype. Is there a microenvironment component that dictates cell transdifferentiation into neuroendocrine or other um, gaining other characteristics? So I'm going to stop there. These are our many funding sources that really help support this. And then Lauren Brady, uh, Ilsa Coleman uh, did the vast majority of the work that I described. A huge amount of help from the UW Rapid Autopsy uh, team and, and program, Larry, Colin Morrissey, and then collaborators at Nanostring. So I know that used up the vast majority of the time, but I'm happy to uh, uh, take any questions either in the chat or or verbally, so I'll stop there. Okay, great, Pete. Thanks, thanks so much. I, I think I unmuted, okay. So I can I can read off a number of questions and let me just go down those. Um, and so first, are there therapies targeting um, at fusion tumors? A yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a very active area of investigation. There's not a specific therapy. It was thought that bromodomain inhibitors, which are trying to get into the clinic, could do it. There was a really recent study arguing that supraphysiologic testosterone may actually have particular effects, especially in the SPOP. It's a whole nother subtype of prostate cancer. So the bottom line is we don't yet have a specific therapy that targets ETS fusions directly. Um, if you suppress testosterone, since these ETS fusions are driven by the androgen pathway, you would indirectly reduce ERG expression, for example. Great, next question, I think you already addressed, but just to be complete, how much did decalcification impact on the bone mat profiles? It's hard for me to quantitate that in a, in a good way. The, the study, we didn't do a rigorous study specifically looking at that. There were only, I think, three bone metastases that we profiled, so overall, um, there were some transcripts that were completely gone um, uh, below the detection limit, whereas in the um, soft tissue, we could clearly see them or, or quantitate them. So I think the overall uh, gestalt was that um, you're clearly losing transcript uh, because of RNA degradation. Um, I think there's probably creative ways to do it. These weren't decaled in any specific way designed to preserve 
nucleic acid. They came through the rapid autopsy uh, approach generally for uh, making TMAs and doing immunohistochemistry. So I think it's an important question to get, dig into. We were surprised that we could measure anything uh, out of them, honestly. Um, so I think it's, it's an approach that has promise, but still needs probably some more rigor to understand it. A uh, question from Nadim Zafaru um, is chief pathology at the VA on neuroendocrine carcinoma. Can it be modulated uh, at cell level to improve prognosis? Is there a role for more frequent use of chemotherapy for AR positive cancer without there necessarily being small cell change to prevent evolution into a small cell carcinoma? And yeah, so related question, sorry, three different questions, Pete. Um, but in colonic carcinoma, the expression of neuroendocrine markers does not seem to change prognosis or therapy, which is interesting. Yeah, there's clearly differences in uh, GI neuroendocrine tumors versus prostate. In this case, um, these tumors lose androgen receptor program activity. So you've immediately lost in general, the ability to continue to target the androgen receptors, and that's mm. a big problem. Um, so you need to use, right now, chemotherapy. Um, there may be an argument if you knew, if you could predict this tumor was very likely to transdifferentiate, it may be useful to use chemotherapy earlier. In general, we use platinum-based chemotherapy. These look almost like small cell lung cancer. Um, the distinction here, which we the whole field doesn't yet have a real grasp on, and that is, there, there, there is clearly a subset of overt small cell, right? And Larry knows this very well. But these other neuroendocrine tumors do not necessarily have a distinctive mm -hmm. histology. And the only way you know them is by immunohistochemistry or doing some other molecular profiling. They seem to have a worse outcome, but we don't yet know how best really to treat them other than the overt small cell. Now, when you do acquire these new characteristics, it does expose new targets. One example being delta-like ligand three or DLL3. And that has been looked at as a target in small cell lung cancer. We clearly see it upregulated in the neuroendocrine prostate tumors. And that serves as a handle or a target for antibody-directed therapies, either antibody drug conjugates or possibly antibody you know, radi radiation tag. So um, we're kind of following along the fields of lung cancer, small cell lung cancer, because those targets seem to be the same. Our work showed that BCL2, for example, is now a target in these small cell uh, neuroendocrine tumors, and venetoclax is now approved as a therapeutic, um, you know, in I think it's lymphoma. So we should be thinking about using drugs like that in, in this transdifferentiated state. Yeah, yeah. great. Um, question from Kelly Smith, who directs the residency program in the Biobank. Uh, does the age of FFP samples affect the digital spatial profiling data results? Yeah, again, it wasn't a, a rigorous study to directly look at that. I think the oldest samples were eight years, maybe nine years old in this study. Um, and that age didn't seem to make a difference. So I think it's maybe more in this case of pre-analytic, pre like how the sample was collected at autopsy, mm. perhaps the time from death to tumor collection, as opposed to explicitly how long it was in paraffin. Um, but I can't say that conclusively. Mm. Um, I think it's worth doing that type of a study to determine how long these, especially for RNA in this case, um, how long the it is able to be uh, sampled and analyzed. But um, we were successful going back eight to nine years very consistently. So that's about all I can say. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a related question, you know, um, and this is comparing the uh, samples from the rapid autopsy and how they compare with those from the primary tumors. And I guess that pertains to the quality of the macromolecules. RNA. Yeah, I think overall, so if you're talking about a like a metast fresh metastatic biopsy, that quality is pristine. Um, the rapid autopsy quality overall is less. I mean, if you look at like frozen 
Rin values of RNA yeah. taken from a metastatic biopsy where you've just immediately processed it, they're much higher than the samples in general from the rapid autopsy. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Eleanor points out in some cancers, adjuvant therapy changes expression of immune checkpoint genes and can synergize with checkpoint inhibitor effects. Have you seen that in prostate cancer? That's a great question. So there was an early study maybe three years ago that suggested one of the next generation androgen receptor inhibitors, enzalutamide, was promoting pdl one expression. Um, there was a lot of excitement around that. Um, and there were trials then building upon that of combining enzalutamide with um, a pdl one antagonist. That hasn't been reproduced. Uh, so I don't think people have looked explicitly at chemotherapy yet in prostate cancer. I, all I can say is that in these patients, heavily treated with just about it, the majority have had every possible therapy and ended up dying of their prostate cancer, which is why we did the autopsy. Um, it, unless it's a transient thing or occurs while you're on that particular therapy, I would say that it's probably not relevant in prostate cancer. Uh, two questions about uh, digital spatial profiling. Um, what's the dynamic range of DSP and how many genes can be detected in each sample? Yeah, so um, the dynamic range is, I would say not as great as bulk RNA-seq if you're doing it from you know, the most uh, pristine sample. Um, mostly because the background is a bit higher um, for unclear reasons in my mind. Uh, whereas the dynamic, you know, the background for RNA-seq is very, very clean. You don't see any transcripts. In this case, you can still see some tags, um, even if that uh, tag wasn't explicitly bound to an mRNA molecule in your tissue. So there is a little bit higher background, which I think reduces the, the dynamic range because your denominator is already a little bit higher. Uh, that said, it was very sufficient, particularly for genes that are abundantly expressed, which we're using to define these phenotypes, the neuroendocrine program, AR program, cell cycle, other things. They were readily expressed at levels that were Quanti quantifiable and could distinguish different tumor types. Yeah. Great, and final question. Um, are there any differences between African-Americans and whites with respect to That's all a of question. the discoveries? Yeah, yeah, I really wish we could answer. Unfortunately, I think in the whole rapid autopsy program anyway, we have one maybe African-American. Um, so it's a huge uh, efficiency in the field in trying to understand that. Certainly we know nothing about spatial profiling in metastases. The two things I can tell you is it looks like not really related to digital spatial profiling or heterogeneity. It seems that um, men of African descent have a lower frequency of the Tempest II erg rearrangement. Um, it's not as common as in Caucasians for unclear reasons. And there is some evidence haven't really seen it, um, I guess, validated. A group at Hopkins looked anatomically at the prostates of African-American men and argued that tumor site development was more frequent, I think, in the anterior region, which is often not sampled as well by biopsy. So Larry, I don't know if you remember that, but Ted Schaefer and others do. kind of yeah. made that case. And I don't know if others have been able to validate that finding anatomically mm -hmm. or not, but at the molecular level, I think we just don't know. Okay. Well, that, that exhausts the question and actually, well, <laughs> runs over time. So finally, there's this cascade of um, accolades, Pete. Great talk, really enjoyed it. And Certainly, I think all of us benefited from hearing what you have done and all of the all the people working with you in terms of understanding this uh, this cancer. So thanks so much, Pete. My pleasure. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Okay.
Bye for now.